So we're, we're a minute into this session and I've already had two children come into the room. Um, so we may break a 2021 record. I think that I'll get us started just about now while Paul gets set up, I'll sort of slow roll us into this. Um, Paul and I have designed, and design is a loose word, um, a rather uh, adaptable schedule for everyone today. Um, our plan basically has two parts. Part one um, is we are going to share some of the work we've done, some performances from the wonderful actors who've worked with us. Um, and we'll also um, really sort of give a, a retrospective of, of what we think we've done and have some opportunity to have some questions about what we're going to do in the future. Um, and then the second half will be the more workshoppy part um, where we will uh, look at some scenes together and we'll uh, work on sort of thinking about staging them and performing them. Um, so one of the things Paul's going to do um, in a few minutes is ask you what scenes you'd like to stage at the end of this. Um, we're really trying to give you a, a, a real time experience of what it's like to work with us, which means we uh, call the shots at the line. Um, so we'll, we'll be soliciting some scenes from you. Um, but first, we're going to start um, with the clip. Um, and then Paul, Lana, Coley, and I will speak a little bit, um, and then we'll get into uh, some more clips and some performances and have time for questions. Um, please, at any point, uh, put questions into the chat. Um, and you know, if, if we want to have a conversation at some point and slow things down, that's fine too. Uh, so Paul, you want to get us started? And but we'll introduce ourselves properly once we get this uh, uh, rolling on. So I think um, you need to unmute while you're sharing video, otherwise it'll stay muted. Yeah, Paul, Paul, there was no volume there. So you're on you're on mute. There you go. My destiny. The start me forth to sorrow and suffering, if any man never was. Even before I came into the light from my mother's womb, Apollo had declared to Laius that still unborn, I will become my father's murderer. All right, so that clip was from uh, Euripides Phoenician Women, and that was our Gary Safis, who worked with us a few different times. Um, and it's from, as many of you know, our series Reading Greek Tragedy Online. Um, uh, I'm Joel Christensen, for those of you who don't know, most of you probably have heard me speak too much this year, um, and I'm from Brandeis University. And part of what we want to do is sort of give you guys sort of the story, um, experience of how we did this and what it meant to us, um, but also talk about uh, what performing tragedy on Zoom have, has taught us um, and where we'd like to go in the future and some of the things we would like to do. I'm really excited about many of the people I see here today because um, we have some old friends, people have worked with us before, Laura, Emma, a translator, Diane Rayer, we've used your work. Um, it's great to meet you. Um, and people I think Paul and I know um, uh, from, from way back. So Krishni, hi, um, Emily, nice to see you. Um, this is you know a great group to have and we really wanna give you the most of us we can in this time. Um, so please do sort of push us in a direction if you want us to go there. But as I said, for, um, for the people who weren't here in the beginning, we're basically gonna divide this into two halves, one sort of expository and we're following sort of three part model which is tell, show, and do, all right? So the second half is gonna be a lot of doing. Um, so let's start with the telling. 
Um, and maybe we can start it out with, with a story. All right. And it will be a three part story and we'll weave in together Paul, Lana and me. Um, so uh, as some of you know, I have no real history in Greek tragedy. I'm a Homerist. Um, and in March, soon after our lockdown, I was sitting in this very room wondering what the hell I was going to do with my life, as many of us probably were. And I had a vague idea that I really just wanted to read Homer because that's usually my response to stress. Um, let's just read some Homer. Um, so I reached out to the Center for Hellenic Studies and I said, well, uh, you know, in an email to Keith to Stone, can we get some people together to read Homer and maybe we'll have Homerists come and talk about it. And Keith said, well, we're already talking to someone. Um, you may know him, Paul, of course I know Paul. Um, why don't you come to a meeting, right? Um, so we came to a meeting, I think it was on a Monday or Tuesday. Um, and then uh, Paul and um, Lana and Keith and I started to hash out this idea. Um, and the basic idea was creating a community around some type of inquiry and performance. Um, and we, you know, started with the Helen um, and then things just went on from there. So that's my rough recollection. Uh, Paul, do you want to pick up there? Well, I'm, I'm happy to report that your rough recollection is, is, is pretty good. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Paul Omani. And I run a theatre company called Out of Chaos um, here in the UK. And I, I had been in touch with Lana because I'd been a, a visiting um, artist at the CHS a couple of times. And um, yeah, when we went into lockdown around about the same time. And I said to um, Lana, why don't we start an online um, reading group? And at that point, it was no more sort of fleshed out than that as a plan. But then with Lana's help, we um, sort of started to put a little bit more meat on the bones of that. And she had the idea of bringing in um, sort of a more sort of discussion around it and how that could aid what we were doing. Uh, and as Joel was saying, we had that, we had a, I think we had a, a meeting on a, on a Monday. And I think my recollection of that is that at the end of that meeting, we all sort of, there was a bit of moments of silence and we said, so should we, should we try and do this then? And it's like, well, yeah, let's, let's try and do it. Let's, let's do it. Uh, and then said, well, when should we try to do this? Um, and I don't know who it was, but someone said, tomorrow? Uh, at which point um, I said, because I was always at the disadvantage, I was always five hours ahead of these people. I was like, okay, well, if it's going to be tomorrow, then I need to leave right now to make some phone calls. Because um, it was about 10 in the evening where I was. Um, and uh, then we did indeed do it the following day, um, our first one, um, which wasn't live streamed but um, which we recorded because we thought we better just see how this <laughs> pans out before we commit it to the internet. Um, and I reached out to a number of different actors that I had worked with and very fortunately they um, agreed to sort of just play and see what, what came of it. Um, and from that then spawned sort of this sort of much bigger project that ended up possibly sort of um, taking over our lives in ways that we hadn't entirely foreseen but in a really wonderful way because the as Joel's already touched on one of the main aims right from the very beginning was creating a sense of community at a time when we were all separate from each other and I very definitely felt that sense from um, what was done um, and also we then tried to just develop things further and further as we went along what started off as being sort of very sort of simple sort of we'll just pick a few scenes and then have some discussion um, we eventually then sort of tried to develop our Zoom craft more and more to how can we stage these plays more fully um, online. And I think at this point I should hand over to Lana. Yes, and your recollections also, also match mine. I'm Lana Coley and uh, I work at the Center for Hellenic Studies as the fellowships program manager and as a librarian. And I'm also, uh, I also had the benefit of receiving various proposals. So it was great, Paul, Paul reached out and then we uh, developed, developed a proposal for the center. And what the center ended up deciding to do is that we could provide kind of human resources. We could provide a team to support this project in different ways. Uh, we could provide some, some technical expertise. We were lucky that we had already been doing some streaming live streams and had been using Zoom for a while. So we were able to to kind of get the ball rolling quite quickly there. 
Um, we also had to do a lot of learning on our feet over the course of, of many months. I mean, hosting Zoom meetings is one thing, but then as Paul mentioned, staging, staging Greek tragedy is, is kind of another thing. Um, and the third thing I would say that the center did was really, was just provide a, a platform for the project. I think the fact that we, um, we've been engaging with, we have a community of researchers that we've built over a long time. We could just sort of uh, immediately start to amplify the project and, and engage with a lot of people very quickly. Um, and I would say with my role, uh, I, I was the logistics person. I did a lot of planning. I was the, the Zoom driver more often than not. Um, and uh, I'm not necessarily a technophile. I like to learn very intuitively. And so there were definitely, the, we, we learned a lot along the way and definitely made mistakes and had a fun time uh, with it. And I think that kind of spirit of ex experimentation is indicative of the project as a whole. We didn't go in as, as you've heard knowing exactly what we wanted to do. Um, I think as a, since I'm a librarian by training, one thing I wanted to do with all of our live streamed video recordings on YouTube is just make sure that those were really well described. So I think another role I had was, was be a kind of content manager and uh, make sure that the, the descriptions had information about the scenes and credits and links to translations whenever possible. Um, I, I think we went into this thinking it was, or I went in thinking, okay, this is like PBS or NPR, we're doing something that's, that's entertaining, but we're also sharing knowledge. But what we ended up creating was more of an open educational resource. And it's, it's been incredible to hear from people how they're using these recordings in their courses this semester or how the, the, the way that the episodes were formatted with performance and discussion that that was something they could show to students as a model of academic discourse or a, a way to um, both exactly as Joel says, tell, show, and do, how you can combine all those different modes. Um, and I would say the third role I had was, was being a kind of recruiter. Uh, Paul, as he mentioned, was a previous visiting artist. I'm the fellowships program manager. So I had a big network I could, I could draw on and it seemed it was so moving uh, in a period of such isolation that continues, but to be able to reach out to our alumni network and uh, to get in touch with, with people who kind of pass through the center. And I was like, well, I, I don't really know that there would ever be a moment when they would get to be called back for something, but this was the perfect project to say, hey, you, you wrote a rock opera on the Cyclops, we need to get you back. I mean, the, uh, that, was, that was a real thrill. And I think people were so touched to have the opportunity to be involved. Um, so th those were the different ways that the center and I were, were a part of it. Well, L Lana, I, I think you undersell how much work <laughs> it is to do the logistics of supporting the project, right? Um, I had several colleagues email me during the process saying, oh, this must be so much work for you. And I was like, no, I really just prepare like I would for a class and then I lose my notes and I show up and I listen. <laughs> Right. Uh, when I know Paul and Lana were doing you know, lots of different work and there was a whole cast of people who were involved in this as yeah. well. Um, so one of the important takeaways for me is that you need a network of people to make this happen. Right. And so then, you know, the, the many hands do make the light work. Um, but I, what I like about the different perspectives we've already had. Um, is that I think so much about the process and what I've gotten out of it. And I've gotten so much of listening to actors, taking their roles seriously, um, teaching me about their characters. Um, and it's really made me completely revise anything I ever would have said about tragedy. Right? Paul and I talk about this a lot. And now when I think about Greek tragedy, I think that it's always a process of reception. Right? It is reception on stage in performance. Um, and it's not, it's not a text. Right. And so I, I've been really happy in later weeks as we've moved, as we moved into taking some more risks, especially in Paul's um, ad adaptation of the frogs, um, where he integrated our performances into the frogs, and I got to play the role of Joel Christensen instead of merely be him. Right. So, I mean, I think, well, what happened in the beginning was we were looking for something for ourselves in a way. And this whole process became something that brought more people in the community. And then we had ideas about making it a form of outreach. And this is, I think, where, you know, Paul and Grant from the, so the Society for Classical Studies made a difference. Paul? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we 
sort of I suppose wanted to do early on but there wasn't kind of quite the the time early, right at the very beginning of the project when we were just frantically trying to get something on every Wednesday at three o'clock eastern um was to try and bring more and more people into it and have more people in interacting and exploring these texts um so there were a couple of ways that we tried to do that um one way um was we we wanted to encourage other theatre companies to to read um, these plays and do their own staged versions of them online. Um, and actually, um, Laura from uh, the University of Wyoming is here, and she um, she worked with a group called Relative Theatrics that are based in Laramie, Wyoming, and they were a group that that sort of took up that offer, and they would read uh, in full the play that we were reading part of. Um, uh, at the end of each month um, and have sort of a community discussion based around that. Um, there's another group that's um, just started in um, Brasilia as well. Um, and we're hoping that there might be others that kind of can eventually sort of um, come out of that. And in addition to that, and uh, and a lot of the um, a lot of the help with this came from a Amy Fistone um, in terms of putting sort of the scheme for this together was with the help of a, a micro grant in the um, Classics Everywhere, I think it's called that micro grant, isn't it, from the SCS. Um, we started a competition called Play Medea, which was then um, anyone in the US or Canada um, um, who was at um, high school or university age, they could um, pick a scene um, that we, they, from six scenes that we had chosen uh, and enter it and we had cash prizes for them and we used the fantastic translation from Diane Rea which was absolutely amazing and what was really lovely about that was not only that we had 100 people participating in that and some amazingly inventive um, ideas that were sort of shown to us um, by um, people of all ages and from across the US um, and in Canada as well um, but it was just a really lovely way that then when we came to um, performing uh, Medea ourselves at the beginning of November using Diane's translation again and announcing the winners there. It was a lovely way to tie them in very closely to what was happening. And that competition is it has now sort of obviously completed in the US and Canada, but they are, it's still, there are versions of it now ongoing um, in the UK. Um, and in the UK, we're using, we happen to be using a, actually the translation they use at A level classical civilization to try and tie in kind of as many of the um, people of that age there um, with that. But we also um, got a competition um, in Greece and Italy um, and we're hoping that there might be some more as well. So there's sort of an on ongoing um, opportunity to try and bring more and more people um, of all ages into, into this project. And I think that that process of integrating new people constantly um, has really, it's kept the ideas fresh and new. It's also given us the opportunity to, to learn more than I think uh, we would have before. I mean, one thing I mentioned in one of the later episodes uh, is the number of hours we spent together working on tragedy well exceeds the number of hours in a full semester course uh, on tragedy that I ever would have taught or taken. And I feel along the way, we sort of developed for ourselves some sort of strange graduate certificate in performing in Zoom. Um, which is part of what we're going to transition to now. Um, so Paul has some clips. Um, I'm going to switch my internet feed because I'm a little wonky while, while he does that. So if I disappear for a few moments, I'll be back. Don't worry. All right, Paul. Great. Thank you, Joe. Um, and uh, I guess I'm going to, I'm going to show um, a couple of clips um, and uh, just to kind of show some of the things that we've been up to but then we're also extremely fortunate that we have some of the actors with us who are going to um, be doing some um, live readings with us um, but I'm just gonna just give a sort of a flavor of of some of the things that we have been um, have been doing um, so just bear with me whilst I share this Have yet, but you will, like a man stumbling into foul bilge water, or swept from shore and drowning in the undertow. As the waves cover your head, you'll see how your life is just a loan that's come due. Death is the payment. 
gods, man. Where justice and the gods converge, there's maelstrom. Your greed for gold leads you down the road to hell. Please him. Strike a name. Strike with the hammer on each side his hands. Rivet him to the rock. Master, grapple him. Wedge him in deeper. Leave no inch to stir. He's terrible for finding a way out from the irremediable. And look. There, near the man killed by the lightning bolt, his noble wife, Ivadne, daughter of Iphis, the king. Why is she standing on the towering rock that looms over the temple, moving along the path? What light! What brilliance the sun conveyed and moon bright in the sky where swift stars shoot through the dark when at my wedding the town of Argos towered up in songs and blessings and praised the bridegroom, Capanius, armed in bronze. To you I have come rushing like a bacchant from my home, seeking the pyre's flame in the same tomb and death to my painful end, and the sadness of living sweetness is this death to die with my dead lover if destiny will allow it. And um, I mean, that's just sort of uh, a few clips from um, some of them. I'm going to show you some more later. What some of that starts to show is some of the things that we started to explore a little bit. Because obviously, all of the actors, we were all just in our front rooms and had whatever we happened to have to hand. And I suppose one of the things that we tried to sort of really use as much as possible was lighting, because it was the one thing that, that sort of suddenly. I knew, I knew no one with a ring light before last year. Now everyone has a ring light sort of somewhere near them. Um, and so we were just trying to use different lighting to create different effects, different times, different sound effects as well, that kind of increasingly became more and more part of the, the Zoom craft. Um, and we'll show some more uh, videos um, a little bit later. Um, I, I'd just like to credit Tabitha Gale with the Zoom craft coinage. I think that was her neologism uh, early on, um, but it was, you know, it was a welcome one. Probably would have happened anyway. Um, so <laughs> one of the things, and so Paul just mentioned the light, but one of the things I noticed um, in, in sort of the contrast with say watching television or live theater is how much more the Zoom frame um, helps me focus on the words and the faces. Um, when we talked to um, actors, you know, they had to, especially stage actors, had to change their craft because your bodies are limited in a way in Zoom um, that they aren't uh, uh, in other places. Um, so, Paul, are we ready to go to the first um, performances, or did I did I step on your your line? No, no, no. You you you've never stepped on my line, um, <laughs> which is how this is, just worked so brilliantly. Um, <laughs> the I think it what would be. What would be great to ask early on though, actually, because we are gonna to get to a point where then we're all gonna sort of just explore some scenes together, would be um, if anyone wants to put into the, into the chat uh, in Zoom, any particular plays that they would like to um, explore a scene from, and then in a sort of, in a, in a, I'll, I'll take a straw poll and, and go with that. Um, so, um, uh, okay, we've got an early vote for Persians, but- um, Oh, oh okay. no, no, no. I'm going to keep, I'll, I will, I will count all the votes at, at the same time, <laughs> um, because that just seems a good way to do that. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, if, if you just keep them coming over the next sort of uh, 10 minutes, then um, I'll, I'll compile some scenes for us to look at. Um, and our, Paul will pick a script, he will make a Google Doc and share it in the chat. Um, and then what we'll do uh, in the second half is we'll break into a couple breakout rooms. Um, we'll work in, in smaller groups on the scenes. Um, so one of the delights of this process has been getting to know and observe really talented actors. Um, and in our first performance today, um, we're going to have um, Tim DeLapp and Eunice Roberts doing a bit from Aeschylus's Agamemnon. Um, so Tim, I think Agamemnon gets the nod.
First, it is right for me to greet this land of Argos and its guardian gods. They share with me the credit for this safe return and for the justice that I visited upon the land of Priam. For the gods decided on the case from listening, not to speeches, but the death of soldiers. And unanimously, they then cast their votes into the urn for blood, the blood of Troy and its destruction. Only hope approached the other urn, but left it empty. And now the conquered city still remains conspicuous by its plume of smoke. The winds of ruination blow in lively gusts, while dying embers spread about a greasy stench of wealth. For this, the gods should be repaid with mindful thanks, because we have exacted punishment for a presumptuous act of theft. And in a woman's cause, the beast of Argos, offspring from the horse's womb, has ground the city into fragments. I mean the armoured troop which launched its leap at dead of night, a flesh-devouring lion that jumped the walls and lapped its fill of princely blood. It's for the gods that I've drawn out this prelude. Also, remembering your sentiments, I quite agree. You have me as corroboration. For it comes to few by nature to admire a friend in times of happy fortune with no taint of envy. I speak from my own knowledge, for I can read the mirror of true attitudes and see that those who seemed so well disposed to me were really shadows, ghosts. And as for what remains concerning gods and city, we'll convene assemblies that are communal, consulting all the people so we can consider how to make quite sure that what works well at present will remain effective in the longer term. And if there's any issue stands in need of remedy, we shall endeavor to avert malignant spread by the judicial use of surgery, the knife, or burning out. And now I'm going into my palace home and hearth, where first I shall do honour to the gods who sent me out and now have brought me back. I pray for victory, as she has followed me to stay on steadfast at my side. Gentlemen, you elder citizens of Argos, I am not ashamed to tell you of my husband-loving ways. It's from my own direct experience that I shall speak about the burdens of my life throughout the time this man was kept at Troy. It is a dreadful anguish for a woman sitting by herself at home without her male, forever listening to malignant rumours. They would arrive man after man, announcing news of ever worse catastrophes. And as for wounds, if this man here had suffered blows as many times as was reported to this house, he'd be more perforated than a net. And if he died, as often as the story's told, he'd have to have been triple-bodied like some second Geryon. Thanks to grim rumours of this sort, I've had to be unbound by others from the noose I'd fixed above and round my neck. And that is why our child, the token of our pledges, yours and mine, is not here by my side, as should have been the case. Orestes, don't be concerned at this, because a family friend is looking after him, King Strophius of Phocis. He wisely warned me of two grave uncertainties, the danger you were threatened by at Troy, and secondly, suppose that popular unrest attempted to contrive a hostile plot. There is a tendency to kick a man who's down. So caution of this kind brings no deception with it. And as for me, the wellsprings of my tears are all dried up with not a droplet left. My eyes are bleared from lying late awake and weeping for my beacon standing there inactive. When I did have dreams, they were so shallow I'd be woken by the whine of a mosquito in my ear. And now that I've endured all this, I can 
with heart released from grief, address this man of mine as God dog of the fold. The force day that secures the ship, the firm fixed pillar that supports the roof on high, dry land to storm tossed sailors who'd lost hope, a flowing fountain to the thirsting traveler. I hold him worthy of descriptions such as these. But let this not attract resentment since we've borne so many troubles in the past. And now, my dearest heart, Step from this carriage, but do not, great king, set down upon the soil this foot which flattened Troy. Come, women, get on with your task of spreading fabrics all along the pathway he will walk. Yes, let us have a passage strewn with purple, so that justice may escort him well inside a home that lies beyond his hopes. Our close attention, ever wakeful, shall ensure that all the rest is, with the gods' help, rightly done. Offspring of Leda, guardian of my house, your speech was fitting to my absence. Stretching out at length. But proper eulogy remains a prize, it's right for others to award. So do not pamper me in female fashion, nor like some barbarian bow down to me with gawping salutations. And stop this spreading of my path with woven stuff which might attract resentment. It's the gods who should be honored in this style. For mortals to take steps upon such ornaments of beauty is in my belief, a thing that's fraught with fear. So pay me homage like a man, I say, not like a god. There is a very different ring between the sound of footmats and of fancy fabrics. Keeping clear of dangerous thoughts remains the greatest gift from God. One should not call a life well blessed until it has been lived right through in full prosperity. If I can act entirely in this frame of mind, then I may rest secure. Well, tell me this in open honesty sure I'll not betray my honest judgment. Might some alarming turn have made you vow these to the gods? If someone with authority had authorised this deed. And Priam, if he'd had success like yours, what do you think? I'm sure he would have stepped upon the precious cloths. Then pay no heed to people's criticising talk. Yet grumbling from the populace can be a powerful force. The unresented man's the one with nothing to be envied. It's not a woman's place to show such relish for a fight. Yet those who reap success may properly concede defeat. Does victory in this contest mean so much to you? Agree. You're still in charge if you give way to me by choice. All right. If this is what you want, here. Somebody unlace my boots. And as I tread upon these fabrics dyed with purple, may no envious eye light on me from afar. I have deep qualms about destroying household properties by crushing underfoot these precious cloths that must have cost much silver coin. So much for that. And now this stranger, offer her a kindly welcome. God looks favorably from afar upon the man who wields his power with gentleness. No one puts on the yoke of slavery on purpose. She's had to come along with me. The army's gift, the bloom selected out of many captured spoils. Well, now I've been subjected to your wish like this. I'll make my way inside my house with trampling on purple. The sea there is, and who could drain it dry? The sea produces many, many dye shells, an inexhaustible supply of welling purple, worth much silver, rich for steeping fabrics. Thank the gods we have a wealth of these, my lord. This house does not know poverty. I would have vowed to trample on innumerable woven cloths if that had been prescribed by prophets to ensure the deliverance of this man's life. 
as long as there's a, the root, the leafage can grow back around the house and spread its shade against the fierce dog days. And now that you've returned to your domestic hearth, your coming signals warmth in winter and in summer, when the grapes are sour, there then is coolness through the palace as the complete master ranges through his home. Zeus, Zeus God complete, now see my prayers through to the end. Make sure those things that you ensure become complete. Eunice as Clytemnestra is going to change change the way I read Greek epic and tragedy for probably the rest of my career. Getting to see her reprise the role repeatedly um, has been amazing. Um, and as I said, we're going to come back to all the actors at the end. Um, and Paul and I picked some of our fam fa favorite performers, uh, but also some of our favorite motifs. One of the things I really enjoyed um, were moments where, um, where sisters, where women were on the screen playing Greek tragedy in an intense way you don't really think about when you're just reading it. Uh, so another, the second scene we're going to give you today is from Sophocles' Antigone, uh, where we have Tabitha Gale and Evelyn Miller as the sisters. Ismene, dear heart, my true sister, you and I are left alive to pay the final penalty to Zeus for Oedipus. I've never seen such misery and madness. It's monstrous. Such deep shame and dishonor as this, which falls upon the pair of us. They say the general has plastered it around the city. Have you heard this terrible news or not? Our enemies are on the march to hurt our friends. No, Antigone. I have had no news of friends, nothing sweet or painful since the day we lost our brothers, both of us on one day, both brothers dead by their two hands. I knew it. That's the whole reason I brought you outside, to hear the news alone. Tell me, you're as clear as fog at sea. It's the burial of our two brothers. Creon promotes one of them and shames the other. Teocles I heard Creon covered him beneath the earth with proper rights, as law ordains, so he has honor down among the dead. But Polynices is a miserable corpse. They say Creon has proclaimed to everyone, no burial of any kind, no wailing, no public tears, give him to the vultures, unwept, unburied, to be a sweet treasure for their sharp eyes and beaks. That's what they say the good Creon has proclaimed to you and me. He forbids me too. And now he's strutting here to make it plain to those who haven't heard. He takes this seriously, that if anyone does what he forbids, he'll have him publicly stoned to death. There's your news. Now show your colors. Are you true to your birth or a coward? You take things hard. If we are in this noose, what could I do to loosen or pull tight the knot? If you share the work and the trouble, in what dangerous adventure? If you help this hand raise the corpse. Do you mean to bury him? Against the city's ordinance? But he is mine and yours. Oh no, think carefully, my sister. Our father died in hatred and disgrace after gouging out his own two eyes for sins he'd seen his own self. Next, his mother and his wife, she was both, destroyed herself in a knotted rope. And a third, our two brothers in one day killed each other in terrible calamity, which they had created for each other. Now think about the two of us. We are alone. How horrible it will be to die outside the law if we violate a dictator's decree. No, we have to keep this fact in mind. We're women. And we do not fight with men. We're subject to them because they're strong. And we must obey this order, even if it hurts us more. As for me, I will say to those beneath the earth this prayer. Forgive me. I am held back by force. I won't press you any further. 
I wouldn't even let you help me if you had a change of heart. Go on and be the way you choose to be. I will bury him. I will have a noble death and lie with him, a dear sister with a dear brother. Call it a crime of reverence, but I must be good to those who are below. I will be there longer than with you. Please don't tell a soul what you're doing. Keep it hidden. I'll do the same. Oh, for God's sake, speak out. You'll be more enemy to me if you're silent. Proclaim it to the world. Your heart's so hot to do this chilling thing. But it pleases those who matter most. Yes, if you have the power, but you love the impossible. So? When my strength is gone, I'll stop. So you just let me and my bad judgment go to hell. Nothing could happen to me that's as bad as dying a coward's death. Watching that performance makes me shudder when I think about how badly I've taught Antigone years in the past, not really seeing the depth that both sisters had or the importance of how they play off of each other. It's something you just can't get when you're reading it um, in class. And um, I mean, both Tabitha and uh, Evie are amazing in bringing sort of three dimensions to these characters. Um, the next scene is from something I don't know if I've ever taught, which is Euripides' Hecuba. Um, and we get Eunice as Hecuba, Tim as Polymestor, and Tabitha as Agamemnon with Evie as the chorus. I came when I heard the shouts, echo ricocheted off of the rock, spreading uproar throughout the army. If I didn't know firsthand that Troy's towers had fallen to Greek spears, the commotion would have caused some concern. I know that voice. Oh, my dear friend, Agamemnon, see what I suffer. Dear gods, oh wretched man, who has ruined you? Who gouged your eyes and blinded you? Who killed your sons? Whoever it was truly hated all of you. It was Hecuba. She did all of this. She and her women, they destroyed me. No, worse. You, Hecuba, is this true? Did you do these horrible things? What, is Hecuba here? Where? Show me so I can rip her apart, tear her flesh into pieces with, with my very own hands. Stop, Polymaster. What is wrong with you? For the God's sake, let me go. I will shred her limb from limb. Enough. No more savagery. I will hear your case and hers, and I will judge you both fairly. I'll speak. There was a boy named Polydorus, Hecuba's youngest son. His father Priam brought him to me to live when... Troy seemed in danger of falling. Yes, I did. I killed Polydorus, I admit it. But I'll tell you why, so you'll see that it was well and wisely planned. I reasoned that if this child survived, he would regather and refound Troy. And if the Greeks found out that this heir to the Trojan throne still lived, they would set out a second expedition, devastate Thrace in the process, and we'd bear the collateral damage of your battles once again. But Hecuba, hearing her son was dead, lured me here with reports of treasure hidden in Troy's ruins. She said we might be overheard, so she coaxed us into the tent, my sons and me. They sat us on a couch. I was surrounded by many hands, some to the left, some to the right. Everyone seemed friendly. Some women sat beside me, exclaiming over my robe. They held the cloth up to the light and praised the craftsmanship of the weave. Others admired my spear and shield, and before I knew it, my weapons were gone. Young mothers fussed over my sons, fondling them, bouncing them in their arms, passing them from hand to hand until my boys were out of reach. Then, out of the blue, these placid women, these mothers, pulled daggers from their robes and stabbed my sons to death while other women pinned me down so that I couldn't move. I tried to raise my head, but they pulled me down by my hair. I couldn't free my arms because so many of them pressed against me. And then, oh, agony. They pulled off their brooches and pierced my eyes until the blood ran thick. Then they ran away. I sprang up after them like a raging animal, bashing and banging my way along the walls, searching for them, hunting them. These are the things that I've suffered in looking out for your interests, Agamemnon. Killing your enemy. Let me tell you, if anyone in the past has spoken ill of women, or speaks so now, or will speak in the future, I'll sum it up for him. 
Neither sea nor land has ever produced a more monstrous creature than a woman. I say this for a fact. Don't blame us all solely on the basis of your woes. Agamemnon, never in the affairs of men should the tongue have more power than facts. Rather, when someone acts well, he should speak well. And if the opposite, his words should be rotten. Glib rhetoric may win us over for a while. But in the end, the smooth talkers die foully. So much for my prologue to you, Agamemnon. Now, to deal with him. You claim that by killing my son, you saved the Greeks from another quagmire of war. What a lie! Tell me, you scum! What possible help could a barbarian like you be to the Greeks? Whose favour were you carrying in your eager zeal, trying to marry into a family to help a relative? I remember you said the Greeks were going to trample all over your country's crops. Who on earth do you think will believe that? I'll tell you the real reason. It was the gold. You killed my son so you could get your hands on his gold. If not, then why is it that while Troy still flourished, while its towers remained intact, while Priam lived and while Hector's spear thrived, and you really wanted to help out Agamemnon, how come you didn't kill Polydorus then, or at least turned him over as a threat? Instead, you waited until you saw the smoke rising from this city that told you our fortunes had turned for the worse. Only then did you kill the guest you had taken into your home, who sat helpless at your hearth. Here's more proof of your evil, if you really had the interests of the Greeks at heart, as you claim. Why didn't you give them the gold right away? That gold, you say, isn't yours, but Agamemnon's. They were in desperate need then exhausted from battle, just barely scraping by in a foreign land, but no, even now you're hoarding that treasure. It's locked up and well guarded in your house, as you told me yourself. And another thing, if you had taken care of my child, as you ought to have, and kept him safe, you'd earn respect and honour worthy fame. Hard times prove the honest friendship of good men, while prosperity always has friends. If at some point you were in need and Polydorus was doing well, my child would have been a great treasury for you. As it is, you have no friend in Agamemnon there. Your gold is gone, as are your children, and you must live on as you are. Agamemnon, if you side with Polymester, you endorse evil. This man has betrayed all trust. He has broken the laws of man and God. He is faithless, irreverent, and thoroughly corrupt. If you acquit him, what then do your actions say about you? Just causes make fertile soil for strong arguments. It pains me to sit in judgment of others' troubles, but I must. What kind of leader would I be if I pushed this case aside, having agreed to take it up? So, here's my verdict. Polymester, you are guilty of murder. Clearly it wasn't for my sake or for the Greeks that you killed Polydorus when he was a guest in your home, but for the sake of getting his gold. Your rhetoric exudes the oily panic of a guilty man uncovered. You've misconstrued facts to put yourself in a more favorable light. Maybe you think killing a guest, in this case, a child who'd been put in your care, is a small matter in the larger scheme of things. But we Greeks think of it as heinous murder. How could I rule you innocent and maintain a shred of credibility? I can't. You committed a brutal crime. Be prepared, therefore, for 
a justly brutal punishment. Ah, how can it be? I'm defeated by a woman, a slave, condemned and punished by my inferior. But isn't that just, since you committed crimes? Oh, my children. Oh, my eyes. Your suffering, what of it? I too lost a child. Do you enjoy abusing me, you monster? Shouldn't I be enjoying my revenge on you? But you won't be soon. When the sea spray takes me on a one-way trip to Greece, swallows you up as you fall from the masthead. And who does the honours of pushing me into the salty brink? You yourself will climb the ship's mast. Will I grow wings on my back or what? You'll be transformed into a dog, a bitch with fiery eyes. How do you know of this metamorphosis of mine? Our Thracian prophet Dionysus told me. Well, he failed to warn you of your own fate. If he had, you'd never have tricked me. So, will I live or will I die? You'll die. And when you do, your tomb will be called. What? Hecuba's doghouse? Cynosoma. The sign of the wretched bitch. A bitch's grave for a landmark and warning for sailors. It makes no difference to me. I've had my revenge. Your child, Cassandra, will also die. That prophecy I spit back in your face. Keep it for yourself. This man's wife, his bitter housekeeper, will kill her. May Clytemnestra never be so insane. She'll kill him too, lifting her bloody axe again. Are you out of your mind? Or just asking for trouble? Kill me if you like. But a bloody bath still awaits you in Argos. You, get this man out of my sight. Did I hit too close to home? And gag him too. Go ahead, gag me. I've already spoken. Remove him immediately. Toss him onto a desert island where no one has to listen to his insolence. Hecuba, you go and bury your two dead children. The rest of you return to the tents of your masters. It's time to cast off. See how the ship's sails flap and billow? The wind is finally blowing. Let us pray for fair weather and safe passage on our voyage. May this be the end of our ordeal. May we find all things well at home, in all our homes. So one of the unfair things we often do is put actors into unexpected positions. There I gave Tabitha about 30 seconds to transition from Antigone into Agamemnon, um, which may be a record for that type of metamorphosis. Uh, the, the last scene we'll see today um, is from uh, the Medea. Um, it's an amazing scene that I'm sure um, Evie is uh, delighted to return to again. Thank you. Women of Corinth, I've come out of the house to avoid reproach. I know that many people prove themselves arrogant, either behind closed doors or in public. Others win a bad reputation just by living quietly. It isn't right for people to hate at a glance before understanding the core of a man, even though wronged not a whit. A foreigner certainly must conform to the state. Even for a citizen, I don't approve if he carelessly pleases himself while offending his fellows. But for me, this unexpected catastrophe has destroyed my life. I know well, the one who was everything to me has turned out to be the worst of men, my husband. Of all who live and can think, we women are the most miserable species. We must buy a husband with abundant goods and an evil even more hurtful than the initial purchase. Take him as master of our body. That is the greatest challenge, whether we win a bad husband or a decent one. Divorce ruins a woman's reputation nor is it possible to refuse a husband. Without instruction at home, you must be a prophet to understand new habits and customs, what sort of a bedmate you will need to manage. If we do a good job with that, and a husband lives with us without protesting the marriage yoke, then our life is enviable. If not, better to die. 
When those at home annoy a man, he leaves, ending his heart's distress by turning to a friend or companion, while we women must look to one soul alone. They say that we live within a house without danger while they fight with spears. They think wrongly. For I would rather stand in the line of battle three times than give birth once. My story, though, is not the same as yours. You have this city and your father's homes and advantage in life and the company of friends. Bereft of my city, I am humiliated by the man who stole me from a foreign land. I have no mother, no brother, no kin to shelter away with from this disaster. That's why I want you to go along with one thing. If I should find some way or means to pay my husband back for these wrongs and his bride and the father who gave her to wed, keep silent. In other matters, a woman is full of fear and weak in weapons and strength. But when she finds herself wronged in the marriage bed, no one wields a mind more murderous. Thank you, Evie. So we're going to watch just a couple clips and then have about 20, 25 minutes of question and conversation. Um, and then we'll watch a couple additional clips while we set up the Zoom rooms. Um, so just to give you a preview, I think we're at, we're going to do three different rooms with three different scenes. We're going to hit you with two scenes from the Persians and one from Iphigenia. Um, so Paul, uh, what, what scenes do you have for us now? Um, okay, so um, I thought that um, as it was Tabitha who um, coined the term Zoomcraft, I would also say that Tabitha was possibly the finest exponent of, of Zoomcraft as well. Um, and um, so I'd like to share um, one of the scenes um, with her from Rhesus, and I'm just going to get it um, all up for everyone now. Just bear with me for a moment. Um, and this um, this scene also um, involves um, Tim and Evie. So you'll see that we sort of have a, a returning team um, throughout. Let me just get it lined up. Excuse me. My lady, Dina, your voice, I hear it and I recognize it. You're always by my side, lady. Oh, always helping me, always there when I have some painful task to perform. Tell me, my goddess, where's this weird man, this, this Rhesus, set up his bed tonight? Not far from here. He's placed away from all the others, from all the Trojans. Hector separated him from the rest, at least until day takes over from night. He's easy to find. White horses are harnessed to Thracian chariots next to him, and those horses shine like the wings of a swan, so you can see them in the dark. Kill and they're yours. To cause war. Diomedes, either you kill the soldiers, or you let me do that while you take care of the horses. No, I'll take care of the killing, and you take care of the horses. You're the one with the clever head, you know all the tricks. Ah, I can see Paris Alexandros heading this way. He must have heard from a guard that there are enemy soldiers in their midst. Well then, here's the man to slaughter. Diomedes? No. Your strength does not surpass that of fate. And this man's fate declares that his death will not come by your hand, but by that belonging to someone else. Now the place where you are fated to slaughter someone else. I'll stay here and make this man, who is my own personal enemy, think that I am his friendly little goddess, Aphrodite, who's come to help him with his troubles. And um, 
it's really lovely actually to kind of go back and look through all of these again, I must say. Um, and the um, the next um, clip that I, uh, I want to share with you is, um, and it's just because um, someone mentioned um, earlier um, when we were sort of talking about possible scenes about um, active chorus and how sort of chorus, and that was one of the real big challenges, I think, in terms of staging anything online. I mean, it's often a challenge when it's in the theatre, I think, as well, that some people um, kind of really struggle with. But online, obviously, you lose quite a lot of the options that might be open to you. Um, we um, we had a, a an episode devoted entirely to the chorus, which was really great, I think, in terms of invigorating our thoughts around that. Um, and later on, we sort of added in kind of um, bits of music here and there. Um, but just I wanted to share one um, particular example, um, uh, just uh, from the Seven Against Thebes. And I think one of the things that was really interesting throughout this whole process as well, and Joel, I don't know whether you might want to say anything around this, but um, I sort of remember early on, we were sort of discussing, or oh, which play should we do sort of next when we're just sort of trying to work them out. And I think you were, we were given the option, oh, should we do Heracles, the Heracles next, or should we do Seven Against Thebes? I think it was the quickest you'd ever reply to an email. And you'll, you've replied to emails quickly, um, but saying, don't do Seven Against Thebes. <laughs> let's, let's, not, let's not kill this thing now. Let's, yeah. sort of, let's, let's hold this off. But it was, it was really incredible. Um, I think often we were coming towards plays where we thought, oh God, what, how are we going to manage that? Is that going to be quite difficult to stage? And then by the time we'd finished exploring it for an hour and a half, um, we were all convinced that that was the play that we wanted to stage um, when we all get to do this um, in real life. And I think Seven Against Thebes was one of those. Um, not least actually, and this isn't the part I'm going to show, um, but because of um, something that became a bit of a convention for us within the series, which was Sarah Valentine's messenger speech, mm. um, and the and the brilliant way that she she sort of ended up taking on all of the messengers, um, pretty much from sort of about the middle of the series onwards, and found new, um, interesting, mad, brilliant ideas for how to make them really, really come to life. And I think that um, that was part of the reason for the success of that. I just wanted to show the very the entrance of the chorus and how we looked at, at that and tried to kind of tackle that sense of panic um, when we were just sort of all in our in our front rooms. I scream out in grief. Their forces flood our walls. The dust filled air I see around us confirms the facts for me. That voiceless messenger's report is simple, clear. Horses' hooves are trembling, my native soil. My ears can hear the noise as it flies here and there. The roar of an unbridled river crashing down on mountain rocks. Oh. All you gods and goddesses, save us. Raise your shouts high above our city walls to turn aside this charging, deadly tide. An army of white shields with weapons raised has launched a full assault against our walls. Their forces pushing our defenders back. All oh, you blessed ones above, seated on your thrones, the moment now has come for us when we must clutch your images. Why waste our time in useless wailing? Do you not hear that noise? That din of clashing shields. What will you do, O oh, Ares? Will you betray the land where you have lived since ancient times? Oh, God. With the helmet of all of gold. Look down. Look down upon our city, which once you loved so well. Come, all you gods who guard our state, defenders of our land, gaze down on us, a group of young girls pleading they will never be enslaved, while waves of nodding helmet plumes driven by blasts from war god Ares smash on our city walls. Oh, oh Father Zeus, who brings all things to their fulfillment, protect us all from enemy hands. And seven warriors, preeminent spearmen in that army, stand fully armed at their allotted posts before the seven gates. And you, oh, Pallas, you Zeus-born power who delights in war, become the saviour of our city. But you, Poseidon, 
Lord of horses, king of the sea, with that fish-spearing weapon of yours, release us from this fear and bring us some relief. You too, Ares. Alas, alas, for us. Serve the place which carries Cadmus' name and openly display your kinship to him. Thank you, Petrus. First mother of our race, protect us. Every one of us is born from your own blood. And you, Apollo, lord of the wolf, become a wolf. And with your howls, drive back our enemies. And you too, Artemis, beloved child of Leto, prepare to shoot your bow. Alas, alas, I hear the rattling din of chariots moving round our city. Oh, Lady Hera, the wheels are creaking as they bear the axle's heavy load. Alas! 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 Yes. Beloved Artemis, the frantic air is trembling as the battle spears fly past. Oh, dear Apollo! The bronze shields clash before our very gates. Oh, child of Zeus, who has the sacred power to sway the outcome of a fight. Oh, listen. Oh, listen. As we young women stretch our hands and offer up these righteous prayers. Oh, dearest spirits above, surround our city. Rescue us and demonstrate your love. <clears throat> and that was just sort of one sort of approach that we tried to kind of use to sort of inject life into a into a chorus when we were just um stuck at home it also showed the danger of not teching things in advance um and i just saw there my my daughter's puppet making an appearance in the corner um but uh but but there you go these things will happen in live performance and you know paul before you you called me out for saying we shouldn't do the seven against thebes um and i'd like to go on record by saying that i think i was wrong at least once per week for the entire run of the year um maybe more times than that um so I, and for me that's one of the things i found most pleasing about the process is how much i stood to learn or proved to need to learn um in each given week um so one of the things that we did though in each episode is really prize on trying to get everybody involved in the conversation um so we're going to take about 20 25 minutes now to just to answer your questions if you have them um, I can drive things and make the actors talk to you, which is what we do sometimes, but I'd really like to have questions from anybody who's here about the process um, for, for any of us. So um, you can put your hand up if you can using the digital hand. If not, um, just chime in. Um, and if it gets too chaotic, I'll start using my, my powers of muting. So let's see, I see uh, Nancy, I see you. Yeah, hi. I'm, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, hi, Joel. How are you? And everyone. Um, I'm, I'd love to hear more about Zoomcraft and the, just the technical aspects of that because I've never heard of it. Okay. So I'm going to put, if Tabitha, if you're listening, can I put you on the spot and have you define Zoomcraft for us a bit? And then maybe we'll bring Paul in to talk about it. Oh, defining words, defining words we've made up. Um, yeah, Zoomcraft. Um, I, if I were to define it, it'd be the process of the process of mixing both theater and film and our circumstances over Zoom to make something that is visceral and something that is uh, what's the word engrossing. Uh, that that uh, that. I am losing my words right now. Um, that suspension of disbelief can be employed here with Zoomcraft. Um, and yeah, it's it's been fun. It's been a process. I think Paul Paul said it best when he said that like he likes using light um, uh, as a way of um, staging things and in my own words, like filling things in and getting rid of some things so that people can more easily believe the places that they're in and I think in finding out that that was one alleyway of uh, baking Zoomcraft, I I'm still finding different ways of making things feel both both like they are that TV medium 
but also having all the aspects of like wonder and whatnot that theater has. I'm getting very lost in my words. I've never actually had to define it before. It's just been like this magical thing that we're all just like jumping to like, okay, what do we have? Like, what are the the things we have around our house or like uh, the, the, the places we have to like sort of make this magical in between. And I think that would actually probably be a better definition. It's a magical in between, between all the, the art forms that we've, we've known. And as a group, you know, in the beginning, I was impressed that people could read off the screen and act and not look weird because I have a hard enough time, time looking at the camera. Um, and those, so you sort of built it up. Paul, what were some of the things that sort of threw down the gauntlet for you in the process of Zoom crafting? Well, yeah, and I think that I think that what Tabitha was saying there is absolutely right, and it's it's about um, it's em embracing all of the restrictions in a way that were imposed upon us and making something of that. It's actually, it's a, you know, we didn't we didn't have a budget, we didn't have sets, we didn't have amazing props that we could cut or you know or design for costumes and things like that that we could work out over a long period of time. We were all rehearsing in separate time zones and sharing ideas over email and actually it was it was simply about what do I have in my wardrobe or what you know what can I steal from my child's toy um, chest or 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 what can I do with with a with a ring light or any other light that I may have that will then just create a sense of atmosphere and actually this I, I thought there was something really lovely about that because it meant that you know you could take you can take, and obviously, I'd, you know, I'd love to take longer and work more fully with productions and build them up. But actually, there's something really wonderful about what's our first thought on this? How can we create this atmosphere? This is the this is the mood that I feel is right for this, and this is where something switches. And how can I help tell that story through whatever I happen to have at my fingertips right now, even if it is just a phone and a and a light at the end of it? Um, and I think one of the things that we discovered through the course of the, um, the whole series was that you can actually, you can sort of um, do a tremendous amount, even sort of just through the, just through the, the distance that you choose to have between you and the camera and what that can tell and what story that can help create. And I think that what was really, um, what was really great in terms of the development of the series was that, as I say, initially, I think, it was just a case of, okay, let's get every, let's let's I'll find six actors. We'll I'll find some scenes. We'll we'll meet up. We'll have one rehearsal, and then we'll just put it on, and then see what happens. But then, a little bit um, further down the line, when we just were able to kind of plan ahead a little bit more, and when we all sort of went, okay, so we are going to do this, aren't we? We are going to do all of the exact. You know, we've we've said that kind of quite glibly early on, but now we are actually going to do it. Then I think what was really terrific and what really helped the series was then also bringing in um, sort of other other directors. Um, uh, I think sort of quite you know sort of reasonably early on we had Beth Burns, who's a director based in Austin, who did a fantastic um, reading of the clouds when we felt that we'd had enough consecutive Wednesdays of tragedies, um, and she brought in loads of really brilliant sort of fresh ideas with that in terms of in terms of staging um, and I think the more that we all of us sort of just practiced what we would I mean it's it's no kind of secret I guess you know you just the more we practiced it the, the more kind of creative we we got about what we might find possible and even sort of the ability on zoom to edit between gallery and speaker view actually in terms of if you want to sort of kind of create, a, if you could create a scene, but then you want to hone in on someone, you've got that opportunity to do sort of the, suddenly to zoom in um, on them. And I think that was all, those were all elements that we sort of grew throughout the 40 weeks. And I mean, and you got, you were playing against expectations in the beginning. I can't remember which video it was, Paul, but when nobody watching knew that Evie and Tim were in the same household and they were on different screens and then joined the same screen, I gasped, right? And I was in on the trick. Um, Krishni, you've been waiting for a bit. What's your question? And then Al, I see you after her. Um, I guess it's kind of a generalizing question. Uh, I don't know of anybody else who has in any other group who has in some way performed all of the extant ancient plays the way this group has done. 
So I guess I was wondering if anybody had any surprise favorites, favorite characters, favorite plays, favorite scenes. Um, I don't maybe start with some of the actors. I know Tim and Evie and Eunice, we've talked a lot about how about your familiarity or lack of thereof before some of these. Um, Tim, what, what jumps out is, at, at you? You and Evie, I think we're in the most. Yeah, um, I, I, I was quite new to a lot of this Greek drama. I haven't really done any of it professionally on stage before. So all of it was really exciting to kind of get a chance to have a crack at. Um, but actually, the one, the one that I felt, I think, I think the ones that I most enjoyed doing during lockdown and du during, doing during this sort of strange time that we're all living through were the ones that kind of I felt spoke most to, to this time. And, and I, I think that's what really made me um, so excited about these plays is, is just how relevant they seem to be. Um, and... And I think I think Philoctetes was was a character and a story that I felt was incredible in terms of his isolation and um, his, his his kind of ability to survive through that period of time and, and through that hardship. Um, and that's a play that I would love to, to see um, done. I think actually, interestingly, it was it was due to be done on stage. Uh, at the National Theatre here in London um, back in April. But so I, I, I guess that will come back at some point. But, um, but that's definitely a, a, a play that I didn't know and I, and I, and I, and I think is, is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with Tim there that it, it seemed to be often the, the ones that just spoke, and, and sometimes it was kind of so specific, week to week, what was happening in each of our different countries around the world. Um, we read Ajax at a time that felt particularly apt. The, the, the discussions of who belongs in a country, um, what you have to do to belong in a country, um, felt incredibly poignant. And, and then <laughs> there are some that have just been very cathartic, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think, Evie, you're right. I mean, there, there were moments during the Ajax when Paul and I were chatting when, and we said, well, this is, this is rough, right? Because the, it was during the, the height of the Black Lives Matters protests mm -hmm. at the beginning of the summer. And we said, we can't not talk about these topics, mm -hmm. right? They're really pressing. Um, Eunice, did you want to uh, share a favorite before we go to the next question? Um, I, I think as, as, as well, I mean, I have very, very little experience of doing Greek theatre, I mean, you just don't, I think that the only time I'd ever done it was sort of Electra at school. And, um, and it's, it, what struck me is that there's such big topics and, and yet not big topics. They're very normal, how people live, how we live now. And we are living through a big time so it's it, it it fitted for me in 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 that way that we we're living through unprecedented times in our own history and and these are you know big big happenings it sounds so trite to say they're big happenings but but they are and sometimes i think they can be rather divorced from us and we can't link to them but because we are living through such big times and actually a time that we're all in our different and unique ways handling. And, and these people handle, it's, it's the choices they make. You know, Clytemnestra, who I will defend in court, um, you know, she, I, I, I totally understand her. Now, of course, the choice to actually commit murder maybe a step too far, but we'd certainly all think it. And I just don't believe anyone who says they wouldn't. <laughs> I think uh, Eunice bit by bit definitely convinced me to be closer to Clytemnestra's side than I ever was before. Yeah. And I was never, you know, Phil Agamemnon. Um, Al? And then Josh and Donna, I see you. Hi all, and thank you so much for doing all that you've been doing this whole year. It was such a light in a very dark time. So bravo to all involved who are here and who are not. I'm 
amazed by these potential of Zoom to be a leveling and democratic medium. I think we're all finding that we're learning on the platform together along with our students. And full disclosure, I'm teaching a course on Greek drama in performance via Zoom this spring. So I'm very intrigued by what you all have to say. But a, a lot of you are coming from theatrical backgrounds of various levels of professionalism. Um, is there a place where you thought your training, your habits got in the way? Is there anything that's particularly attractive about Greek drama with respect to Zoom craft? Is it easier to do Medea than it is to do Hamlet? Um, and then last but not least, and you can answer any one of these or perhaps none of them, um, do you have any advice that you'd give a complete performance novice uh, to find kind of footing and comfort on the Zoom platform? Uh, so Ali just asked a lot there. So I'm just going to give, sorry, you know, you they're all great questions. Um, and let's, so I'm just going to, for no apparent reason, go Eunice, Tabitha, Evie, Tim on this one. Let's hear a little bit from each of you. I, I think for, um, I think the, one of the final question was um, a novice hand, handling it. I think it's, um, it, it's almost a bit like radio really. And it's talk to a friend, you know, the, you've got your laptop there in front of you. And it's not thinking of performing as such, but it's talking to a friend. I guess I'm next. <laughs> um, so I, when I directed, I got to direct two things uh, with the, the Center for Hellenic Studies. Thank you again for letting me do that. It was so much fun. Um, and I had one actor who pointed out something that I didn't even notice because I was having so much fun. We literally got on a Zoom call and sat there for, I think, I think four hours. I think four hours. I think we were just on Zoom for four hours. Like, okay, let's just play around. What can we, like, you, you have string lights in your bathroom. Bring them here. Let's see what we can do with them. And that produced a really cool uh, moment in, I think it was fragments uh, where she like, you know, had lights on her hand and she opened her hand and ooh, like this cool symbolism for uh, her um, finding a way to tell her story, finding a way to like have a voice. Um, I think it's, it's essentially what Eunice said, like just sitting around on Zoom and playing and thinking about, I guess what, what feeling or like what main motifs or themes run throughout whatever you're working on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Evie and Tim? Um, great questions. Yeah, I, I, I don't think my training ever got in the way, but I don't know if anyone's training fully prepared them for Zoom. I think a lot of the basics and a lot of the things that I think all good acting involves are the same. Listening, which is obviously harder on Zoom. Um, you know, using your own voice and finding what it is in you that connects to what it is you're reading. Um, yeah, but it's odd, you know, it's odd. Looking, staring into a camera feels very strange. It's not you're not looking into someone's eyes, but I think that is quite important. As an audience, I feel like it's much more engaging when someone's staring at the little dot at the top of their laptop. Um, so, and to answer, uh, to move, because we do have some questions, so we'll move on. Sorry, Tim, we'll get you next time. Um, to answer your first question, Al, about the democratizing aspect of it, um, I think there's some real potential there when people are willing to be collaborative and sort of let their guards down, right? Um, and I don't want to do it. I didn't come into this to do a plug for the Center for Atlantic Studies, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, because in my experience, and I was first a fellow there, I think in 2013 or 14, has been one uh, where they have encouraged collaboration and sort of trying to think outside some of our normal academic boundaries. Now I know for the actors, this they, they, they may not be as familiar with the kind of weird walls we set up as academics, um, but I've learned more from listening to the actors talk about their roles and their approach than I learned in any course I'd taken about tragedy in my lifetime, right? It's that simple. I mean, some of the conversations, um, especially, you know, Evie, Tabitha, so some of the things they said about their characters are, are worth books, right? Um, I mean, I've read many articles that have said less. And again, not to 
denigrate our field too much. Um, so I think part, part of the, the spirit of saying yes to people who are outside our, our expertise and just seeing where they take us is one of the, is the, the thing that Paul and I have been talking about a lot, right? We've been saying yes to each other for years now. Uh, that doesn't sound quite right, right? Um, but I would say, you know, that, that's the impact is saying, look, what do I bring to this? And what can other people bring to it too? And what can we do together? And so I think this leveling playing field can really help um, in an important way. And there are reasons, and there are small things you can do to encourage it, right? Like setting the tone, everybody talks, right? Everybody has equal access to sort of inspiration for this moment. Um, so I just talked too much. Uh, Josh, what's oh, your question? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, it, and actually, Joel, in a lot of ways, you sort of anticipated the very question I was going to ask. I'm, I'm really interested um, in, in, in the sort of uh, process as pedagogy or production as, as pedagogy. And I think, um, yeah, this series will, will not only be a very beneficial resource just as, as far as watching videos, but I, I think in a lot of ways, this could even become a, a, a model of sorts for approaching various dramas. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious if like, any sort of, uh, maybe not completely codified, but if any sort of like protocols or procedures sort of quickly established, and I know what we have the um, kind of workshop following afterward, but that's that's what I'm really interested in this question of, uh, is, is just saying, all right, students, here's, here's, um, here's a tragedy, pick what scenes you think are meaningful, run them through, if, if, you, if, if you or maybe some of the other actors can maybe talk to, uh, talk to that sort of process. Yeah, I think we can each add a little bit. And so I, I joked in the beginning that the way I prepared was to read, take notes and then lose my notes, but that's actually what I would do. And then just sort of practice active listening. So it's still a class, but one of the things that we get back from performing it together is that 90% of the experience of tragedy that you lose when you don't sing it, when you don't dance it, when you don't experience it in a large group in a ritualized setting, All right? And so I think we can give some of that back um, and also as a moment of sort of interpretive ethics, um, when you make the students the performers, you authorize them as readers of the text in a way you don't when you just come in and ask them what they think. So for me, there are practices you can, you can um, adapt to a classroom without going into full performance. Paul, do you wanna talk about the process a bit? Yeah, I'd say that one of the, I think one of the things that that felt really lovely in sort of the ensemble that ended up kind of being created. And we ended up with you know, over 70 different actors being involved in this project um, is that everyone was so generous and so giving of themselves um, and so willing to take any kind of just grain of an idea and run with it and just see what happened with it and take it to all sorts of different places. And I thought that, that actually that kind of led to some of the discoveries that that um, Joel's talking about there as well, because essentially what we showed every Wednesday was only ever our second rehearsal. And so there was never a sense of, ta-da, there it is. That is my total interpretation of this character or this scene or whatever it might be, because actually it's all part of a process. You know, as a performer, as an actor, you're never gonna think that's it. I've got, you know, that's, that is that character. I've got it nailed. And, and you are allowed to make mistakes. And in fact, actually, I, I always think in a rehearsal, the most interesting sort of discoveries come through mistakes. And I think that allowing, um, be they performers, be they students, whoever, to sort of say, okay, let's, let's try this idea and see, see where it leads to. And even if then you end up going, well, overall, the scene doesn't, doesn't work if we take it that way. But actually, there is something in that particular moment that really does work and really says something about this character in this particular moment, then that's, I think, very, very valuable. And you can discover that you, you just, you learn as an actor in rehearsal through trying. You try, you make a mistake, and then you try again. And that's how we kind of came up with any of the decisions that we sort of did, did make. <laughs> the magic if, correct. Uh, Donna, you've been waiting for a bit for your question. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I look like the Cyclops today, or I would unveil myself. I've got a, I've got a major eye infection going, so I am not there uh, facially, uh, but I am physically. I am a stage director. My background is not the classics. I, my home as, is in the Honors College, 
You probably can tell by my regional accent, I am in the South, Mississippi State. And uh, my home is the Honors College. And every year we do Classical Week. And it's all classics. And so I have gotten over several years involved with the classics that way, although I direct a variety of other productions in different periods and all of this. So that's sort of a quick background. What I have found a little bit confusing as I watch Zoom performances is the focus of the individual actors. I never know if they are looking straight in the camera as if we watching uh, are the audience, or sometimes they look to the side, to the left or to, to the right, and I am wondering if they are talking to the other character who is on another Zoom screen wherever in the world. Are they having a, are they looking at them? Are they looking at the audience? Are they looking at the gods? I have, I have problems understanding where, is it foci or focuses? I don't know. But, and then I don't know sometimes if they are, and this is not a slam, but I do not know if they are in fact reading from the script, like oral interpretation, which is a no-no, or if they are actually performing it. And sometimes I can tell by the way they use their eyes, and uh, sometimes they're so good that I cannot tell. Does it make a difference? Well, for non-performing arts majors that I teach, um, I, mostly, I mostly teach STEM students. And they have found performing is a wonderful asset to their curriculum and to their mental state um, during all of this stuff going on. I'm always talking about focus. Who are you focusing on? Where are you looking? What's going on off stage of your uh, proscenium Zoom screen? Um, so I just wondered, as I have gone on and on and on, was just wondering if you all, as professional artists, could shed a little bit more light on your focus when you are quote, quote, performing or reading or whatever, so that I might go back into the classroom in only a few days um, and instill some of that with the students as we look to this semester of doing some things. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Donna. And you're asking a question I've wondered about myself because when I see videos of me, I realize how awkward I am at it. Um, let's start with Tim and Evie, um, since you two, I think, have done a bit of a lot of this and then hear from Eunice and Tabitha too. So, Tim? I think it's a very, very good question. And, and, and um, certainly for us doing these readings of Greek tragedy, we are reading. They are definitely readings. Um, I, I, you know, just in terms of the, it's just the time frame we've we've not had the time to rehearse and learn and you know tackle the the entire canon um in that way um but so so, so we are reading and it's it's interesting from each scene and from each um performance it varies i think we have been encouraged by paul and the directors to imagine as far as we can to kind of lift the text off the screen and imagine that we are talking to characters in front of us or to the sides. We've also experimented with looking to the left or to the right or up or down according to where the other zoom lenses are on the screen but then that's very very difficult because obviously we don't know so we have to have that kind of outside eye who's looking at what the audience is looking at. So this is where Zoom is an entirely new uh, art form, if, if you want to call it, call it that. So it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. And, and, um, and I think for, for me as an actor, 
you know, it's definitely the area that needs the most kind of work. And, and um, I think we're all unsure about that element of it. Um, I, I, I mean, I think sometimes w w why the Greeks and Shakespeare could work so, so well in this format is that the sort of the soliloquies and those big speeches actually do suit this, um, this format because you can kind of then look into the camera as if you're looking at your audience. So I think those moments are really clear for me. Um, but it's but it's the big scenes where where you're sort of in dialogue with another character or two or three characters that 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 becomes really difficult. I don't know what. Everyone yeah, says. I've done a couple of other Zoom performances as well, and I think um, I would say first and foremost, I desperately miss making eye contact with another actor. Um, you know, acting is reacting, and and on Zoom you can obviously hear what the other actor is doing, but it's not. It's like a radio play, exactly like Eunice said. And I think the different options, I think they're all valid, the kind of, you know, these decisions to look like you're looking at someone who's below you on a screen. Um, I think they do different things. And I think different texts and different styles of um, script and performance, they suit different things. Um, for me, I think there is something so intensely powerful about the, the language in these plays that just to deliver it very simply um, and directly for me works. I think, and you know, I might be wrong, I find it definitely more engaging um, when I can see someone's eyes fully when I'm listening as an audience rather than kind of seeing an entire scene from this angle. Um, but that's personal preference and I think everything's, everything's valid. Uh, Tabitha? <laughs> sorry sorry it's okay i lost my mute button there um sorry. yeah no i we've tried a bunch of things through this format which i think you know uh evie and tim definitely already said looking to the side looking up looking down um for me at least with these texts i find it i also find it engaging when i can see people's eyes and i love um I mean, I don't love it because I, I'm not saying anything that has not already been said because as an actor, you want to see the other person. Like you want to like be able to live in the moment and, you know, be to beat all of that. Um, but again, you have this script and you've had like, you know, a day with it to do whatever you're going to do and like find out what the situation is. Um, in both like my having been an actor in several productions and productions, several readings, several readings, um, and having gotten to direct a few, like, I really do like um, having all the actors, like, look dead on and being able to, when I'm in the audience, like, see, especially when there's only two people on screen, like, be that third audience member in their conversation, at least with this text, because I do think it's valid that, like, as Evie said, different things do different things for different texts. Yeah. Um, so Lana wanted to jump in. Sorry, we'll get to you, Paul. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and say, I think also going back to the conversation about Zoom craft, just that using this medium as like appreciating what it is for what it is and not trying to replicate what you would see in theaters um, with kind of the turning and the, the different eye lines. But um, think, going back to what Tabitha was saying, thinking about this as film in a way and using foregrounding and what happens when actors get close to the camera and when they move back. I think some of the clips that Paul showed were really showed how effective you can be by just playing with the, the two feet between your face and the camera and how even just moving back and forth kind of changes changes things or what the camera focuses, focusing the audience's attention on different body parts and uh, parts of the face are all really effective and that doesn't uh, doesn't take a lot of technology or anything it's just planning um, the shot in a way yeah and, and to pick up on that I think as well um, Lana and to kind of hope to answer partly Donna your question but also sort of the question about sort of how well suited is is sort of tragedy to this kind of zoom medium and I think that picking up on what Joel was saying about how you end up listening more and I think that there is because of the simplicity we don't have 
sort of uh, all the frills that we may have otherwise we don't have um you know sort of a 50 foot high um, proscenium over us or anything like that actually um it just you just, it boils down to the argument and then it's just a very sort of simple a very simple staging i think works really effectively and actually serves the play really really well and i think that you end up stripping away the sense of i think a lot of the time people get sort of stressed about this. They say, what's my take on this? What's my sort of, and actually that, but what's, but what's the story? What's the argument? What does each character want? And those are the really essential questions. And those are the only ones that we can really answer in this medium. So in a way, I think it works really, really nicely. And the, the ability to then talk so directly to an audience and to be in an audience's face so much more than would be um, possible or indeed acceptable or desirable um, in real life, uh, there's so many people all at the same time and I think that you can then you then have the opportunity to cast the audience almost in different roles as well right that they become they become whoever you know whoever I always think that's kind of something really important as an actor to think about anyways who are you talking to you're not just talking to the audience who are they who are they to you what do you want to what effect do you want to have on them and then you can really start to cast them you can make them the gods you can make them the people that you're trying to convince to let you in whatever it may be but I think that this medium works quite well with that and the other thing I think that works kind of quite interestingly with this as well is that you um is that sense of being sort of the third character when there's when there are two people talking and there's a third character and I think that you I think actually and, it's, and I say this with the with the tremendous experience of having played a very silent pilotes for um, about sort of four hours, um, but that you, but it really sort of actually foregrounds that this person still exists on stage, and what are they doing there, and what does that affect about the scene? Because it's not they're not just upstage right, and we don't really notice them because we're co focusing on the two people downstage left. Actually, they're there, and how does that change the dynamic of what's going on? So I think there are there are loads of things that we can take. As being kind of really nice about being in a Zoom, but it doesn't then detract from the fact that obviously I'd, I'd like us all to be in in a room instead. So we we are um, moving through time, as you all can tell. Uh, but I do want to uh, honor the the questions that were uh, volunteered before. So Jamie and then and then Nancy, Jamie. Um, thanks. I'll be quick. Um, I guess I was thinking about um, going back to the sort of pedagogical value, but also um, the theme is resonating in this time and um, the sort of need for art right now. I'm wondering um, how, in what ways maybe you've seen either other projects or in uh, outreach that this project has done, um, maybe um, because the professionals are also sort of refiguring out and playing around so much and needing to relearn it. Is that an opportunity for amateurs or people who wouldn't otherwise kind of uh, um, be, be, be do theater at all, whether it's science majors or um, just people who would be scared about that? Is that an opportunity either because we need it so much or um, because everyone else is trying to figure it out too? I mean, so we've definitely blended sort of, you know, professionals and amateurs, if we want to use those terms. Um, and I think, you know, Paul, you can follow up after this, but I haven't seen so many performers in our group as, as people who are engaged in reading the plays and viewing them who might not have been otherwise, right? Which is sort of a first sort of st step in, in the outreach. Um, but Paul, uh, what else have you seen of sort of groups sort of engaging in this type of performance that may not have otherwise? Um, yeah, I think it's a it, it is a it's a really good question, and um, I, I worked with a bunch of students at Wesleyan last semester as well on a production. Um, most of whom weren't performers actually, and I think there is um, in fact actually sort of in that um, in that performance there were some of the people who who weren't performers who'd never performed before who were the most engaging and the most um, they brought a freshness to what they were doing because they weren't encumbered by sort of that maybe for some of us we're thinking oh is this theater is this film what do i do where i'm kind of sort of maybe stuck in between but there's like i'm just gonna I'm just gonna read it and do it in the way that makes sense to me kind of right now um and it's been you know it was really lovely in our oedipus at colonus we had some students involved and in our antigone as well we had some students um some high school students in fact involved um in the in the readings and i felt that they they 
acquitted themselves really brilliantly um, and brought, yeah, I, I think there is, I think what you're sort of suggesting, James, is that sort of the fact that we're all just searching things out, all sort of finding things, there is no set way of doing it, is a really kind of lovely, um, generous place to be as professionals, amateurs, all in together, because we are all just then sort of at the same point. And then bringing our own different experiences, of course, and having a few ideas about how we might bring something to life. But actually, we're all um, in the same happy, well, we're all in the same predicament. Not necessarily. <laughs> yeah, happy is an interesting choice of words there, Paul. Yeah. Uh, I, I received <laughs> Nancy, in a good Homeric ring structure, you asked our first question and now our last. Uh, and you're muted. Okay. Um, okay. Um, gee, this has been a wonderful experience. And um, I my question, I partly put in the chat, but it was about props and the way that um, that the Zoom for the Zoom medium seems to frame soliloquies and allow um, a stripping down. I think that was implicit in someone's comment, but so that the pro a prop like um, uh, like the robe in the Egg Memnon uh, bath scene or can be um, dramatically present to suggest what's absent. You can, how you can manipulate in a different way when you're, when you're using film and Zoom uh, to sort of suggest what isn't there. To and that the way that that absence involves the work of the of the viewer is what interests me theoretically about this whole project. I mean, I feel as if there's a lot of theory that could be developed nicely talking about um, drawing people in or keeping them out which is something I've been reading about a lot. So that was one comment. And then the other thing is that Helen Eastman and um, Alex Silverman and I have been working on performing Pindar projects. And we just had a, we just had a, a performance at University of Georgia's Spotlight of the Arts that I'd love to share with anybody who's interested. But uh, Helen explored in Pythian 9, the silent character of Cyrene when she's being um, talked about by Apollo and Chiron, and Chiron's about to abduct her. And it's, she did, we did the performance with one character, then with two characters, and then with the silent third character. And that, that was very illuminating to me. And it reminds me of Cassandra in the, in your Agamemnon performance and how powerfully she uh, expressed the plight of the, of the, uh, Garas of the prize who's brought home by the warrior. So I just was, I'm very interested in the silent character aspect that we you performed, but thank you for everything. It was great. See, and, I, and I agree that what's left out is, is, you know, gives us so many opportunities to create the sort of text on our own. Um, so on, right now we're, we're going to have, uh, we're going to transition into the do part. We're going to have three breakout rooms I'm going to create. Um, there'll be two Persian rooms one Iphigenia. Um, if you guys would do me a favor and just put in the chat box if you really, really, really want Iphigenia, and I'll just put everybody else in Persians. Okay. Um, and so they'll be led one, the Iphigenia group will be led by Evie and Tim, and the Persian groups will be two different groups, one led by Tabitha, one led by Paul, and maybe Eunice. Um, and I'm going to, uh, Paul's going to set up some clips for us to watch while I try to do the most complicated breakout room creation I've ever engaged in, okay? Um, so I've put the uh, Google Doc with our scenes in the chat. Um, make sure you can get, get that. And Paul, you wanna take over and I'll just start uh, doing the breakout thing. Sure, yeah. Um, and actually, um, I thought just, um, and Nancy, this may not be sort of um, hitting the exact right moment here, but um, I just thought, um, just because you mentioned the Agamemnon, um, I've just sort of quickly looked up just a small section. So um, we had Toff Marshall um, coming in to work with us. He was our he was our triple threat um, in this um, thing because he not only was he gone as an academic, he acted and he directed. So he's the he's the Zoom tragedy triple threat. And um, uh, I just thought I'd just share just one quick moment with that. Um, I've not looked at it all the way through, 
because I'm just doing it in response to what you've just said. So I'll stop it at some point. Um, so um, again, just bear with me while I move to um, sharing screen. Um, and... No one puts on the yoke of slavery on purpose. She's had to come along with me, the army's gift, the bloom. Select out of many kills. Well, now I've been subjected to your wish like this, I'll make my way inside my house with trampling on purple. The sea there is, and who could drain it dry? The sea produces many, many dye shells, an inexhaustible supply of welling purple, worth much silver, rich for steeping fabrics. Thank the gods we have a wealth of these, my lord. This house does not know poverty. I would have vowed to trample on innumerable woven cloths if that had been prescribed by prophets to ensure the deliverance of this man's life. As long as there's the root, the leafage can grow back around the house and spread its shade against the fierce dog days. Now that you've returned to your domestic hearth, your coming signals warmth in winter. And in summer, when the grapes are sour, there then is coolness through the palace as the complete master ranges through. Um, I just thought that might be um, kind of picking up on what you're saying. And I think one of the um, one of the things that um, comes out as well, I think, in this medium is how um, actually you, we can pick up on symbols very very clearly obviously they're kind of very clear like that but then later on in that production as well when Eunice returns as Clytemnestra she then has you know sort of a lovely red a lovely sort of um, red scarf as well coming on and that was something that we tried to kind of pick up throughout um, the trilogy um, and I think that this yeah this medium responds to that kind of clear symbolism really really nicely um, and again, I, and sort of picking up on something about sort of silent characters as well, I think sort of the, the ability to have Cassandra sort of so clearly um, in that one background as well um, is a really powerful way of, of, showing, of showing that moment. Um, I'm just going to share um, another couple of um, videos with you. Um, and this then, we're going to return now to um, the Seven Against Thebes, because who can ever have enough of a performance of Seven Against Thebes? I think we can all agree, no one. Um, and here's just a little bit from later on in that play. But look, Ismene and Antigone are drawing near, coming to carry out a better rite, their brother's funeral song. I do not think there can be any doubt their deep and passionately loving hearts will chant a fitting dirge to mark their grief. Alas, for you two sisters too, of all women who bind their robes beneath their breasts, the most unhappy in your brother's fate. My tearful sighs come straight from my own heart. My lament tells how I truly feel. You hard-hearted, senseless men. You showed no trust in your own friends and would not rest when troubles came. Your unhappy spears you fought and now have won your father's home. Alas, alas, you two who sought to overthrow the walls of your own home and looked with bitter eyes to being the only king have now been reconciled with swords. And thus, indeed, the sacred fury of Oedipus, your father, ends her work. You struck and were struck down. And you were killed while killing. You slew him with a spear. And from that spear you died. Such a pitiful act. Such wretched agony. Let our groan sound. Let our tears flow. Now you lie dead. You did the killing. Alas. Alas, my mind is mad with grief. My heart groans here inside. I, you pitiful man. You too, his wretched brother. You lie there, dead, killed by your own kin. You slaughtered him, your own dear relative. A double grief to talk about. A double sight to see. Such sorrow all around them. One brother, 
lies beside his brother. Um, and I'm just going to share one final moment, just as a, um, a slight um, change of uh, mood um, with that. And this is um, a scene from um, Alcestis. Um, and I will start that share. Hey, you. Why do you look so sober and righteous? A servant should not be sullen to guests, but give service with a smile. <laughs> but he, when you man come to the house who is your master's friend, you treat him with gloomy looks and a scowl on your face and are more interested in the troubles of some outsider. Come here and let me teach you a thing or two. Do you know the secret of life? I doubt it. How would you? Listen up. Everybody has to die sometime. And nobody, not a living soul, knows if he will be alive tomorrow. And around she goes and where she stops, nobody knows. You can't learn it in school or a workout system. Now that you've heard this, and don't forget that you learned it from me, not to worry, drink up and live your life one day at a time. The rest belongs to Lady Luck. <laughs> oh, worship Aphrodite. How oh, sweet, sweet goddess to men and women. Forget the rest and listen to what I'm saying. If I'm making sense, and I think I am, won't you give up your infernal grief and come inside and have a drink with me? Let your hair down! Oh. Oh. I guarantee you that raising a few glasses will carry you away from you from your gloomy, constricted state of mind. Mortals have got to think mortal. To all you high and mighty disapproving types, if you want my opinion, you ought to live a little before you die. Life isn't all tragedy. I know all that, but laughing and carrying on are not appropriate in our present state of affairs. A woman is dead who is not even a member of the family. Do not grieve so much. The masters of the house are still alive. What do you mean, alive? And um, <clears throat> just before we kind of now, I know that um, and Joel's got everything ready and we'll be heading into our breakout rooms shortly. As, and one of the, like, just one of the other joys has really been just meeting loads of um, new actors as well. A lot of the, a lot of people are people I've worked with um, in various kind of places, um, but then like, Rene Thornton Jr. Um, was someone that Beth Burns introduced into the project and then uh, sort of has played Heracles in a few different places and was just, you know, totally, a totally joyful person to, um, to meet through this, which has been really great. So we're going to spend 30 minutes in our breakout rooms right now. I've assigned seven, eight, and eight. Um, and uh, there are two Persian rooms. Paul, you're going to be leading Persian one. So just take the first Persian scene. Our goal is to have you work with the leaders in each room the, um, to put together a few minutes of scenes um, to perform for the group when we come back. Right. Um, and so, you know, this could just be 30 seconds or more three to five minutes, but let's try to set a target at no longer than five minutes and really to be self conscious about the process as we're going through it. Um, I'm going to jump between rooms. If you need to be moved for some reason, just private message me when we get in the room and I can do that. Um, but also the, the hosts in each room um, should be able to move you if they need to. Um, in addition, uh, we've all been sitting for two hours straight, so please feel free to take a few minutes to stretch, to get a drink, to use a bathroom or whatever. Um, and the rooms will open automatically, and as many of you know, they'll close automatically too. So be ready in 30 minutes, because ready or not, you're coming back. All right, so good luck and have fun.
Hold on.
All right, I see everybody making it back in. I bounced around the rooms and listened and it seemed exciting and it also seemed like you didn't quite have enough time. So now you know exactly what every Wednesday was like. Um, uh, <laughs> what, what I think I'd like to, what we should do, I think, is have each group go around and perform whatever they want to. Um, and then we'll have sort of a debrief afterwards and talk about the experience and some of the conversations you had. Does that sound good? Okay, everybody just give me a thumbs up if that seems good enough. All right, so I'm gonna start with the way I made the groups. Let's see, wait, who is, uh, Amy said she was getting, going to get a prop. Amy, are you back? Yes, okay, so we're gonna start with Iphigenia, then just do Persians one and two. Um, so I guess uh, Evie and Tim, you're in charge. You wanna introduce your group? Oh, with, with pleasure. Um, I don't know, just, does everyone else want to turn their videos off? Does that make sense? If, and then, and then um, you can also do the crafty thing if people fancy it, where if you go to a screen of someone who's got their video turned off and go to the three dots in the corner, on the drop down menu, you can select hide non video participants, um, which will make, you know, it's like zooming in. Um, I mean, obviously, no one had enough time but I think our group are fabulous and it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, let's all make sure we're unmuted um, and then, yeah, great. Whenever we're ready. Started. we missing our chorus? Aaron, are you there? <laughs> um, oh, no, he's, I don't think he's on the call anymore. Ooh. I think we're missing our chorus. I mean, I think Melissa and- and I could <laughs> jump in if we need. Let's this is Let's. how dramatic. <laughs> Shall we begin? Yeah, let's. Okay. Let us stand here, maidens of Colchis, and lift the queen from her chariot to the ground without stumbling, supporting her gently in our arms with kind intent that the renowned daughter of Agamemnon, just arrived, may feel no fear. Strangers ourselves, let us avoid anything that may disturb or frighten the strangers from Argos. I take this as a lucky omen, your kindness and auspicious greeting and I have good hope that it is to a happy marriage that I conduct the bride. Take from the chariot the dowry I am bringing for my daughter and convey it within with careful heed. My daughter, leave the horse-drawn chariot, planting your faltering steps delicately. Young women, take her in your arms and lift her from the chariot and let one of you give me the support of her hand that I may quit my seat in the carriage with fitting grace. Some of you stand at the horse's heads for the horse has a timid eye, easily frightened. Here, take this child, Orestes, son of Agamemnon, baby as he still is. What, sleeping little one, tired out by your ride in the chariot, awake to bless your sister's wedding for you, my gallant boy, shall get by this marriage a kinsman gallant as yourself, the Nereid's godlike offspring. Come here to your mother, my daughter, Iphigenia, and seat yourself beside me, and stationed near, show my happiness to these strangers. Yes, come here and welcome the father you love so dearly. Do not be angry with me, mother, if I run from your side and throw myself on my father's breast. Hail, my honored lord, King Agamemnon. We have obeyed your commands and have come. Oh, my father, I long to outrun others and embrace you after this long while, for I yearn to see your face. Do not be angry with me. You may do so, daughter, for all of the children I have born. You have always loved your father best. I see you, father, joyfully after a long time. <laughs> 
And I, your father, see you. Your words do equal duty for both of us. Oh, hail, father. You did well in bringing me here to you. I know, I know not how I am to say yes or no to that, my child. How wildly you are looking, spite of your joy at seeing me. A man has many cares when he is king and general, too. Be mine, all mine today. Do not turn to moody thoughts. Why, so I am. All yours today. I have no other thought. Then smooth your knitted brow, unbend, and smile. See? My child, my joy at seeing you is even as it is. And do you then have tears streaming from your eyes? Yes. For long is the absence from each other that awaits us. I do not know, dear father. I do not know of what you are speaking. You are moving my pity all the more by speaking so sensibly. My words shall turn to senselessness if that will cheer you more. Alas, <laughs> hmm. the silence is too much. You have my thanks. Stay with, your, stay with your children at home, father. My own wish, but to my sorrow, I may not. Ruin sees their wars and the woes of Menelaus. First will that, which has been my lifelong ruin, bring ruin to others. How long you were absent in the bays of Aulis. Yes. And there is still a hindrance to my sending the army forward. Where do men say the Phrygians live, father? In a land where I wish Paris, the son of Priam, had never dwelt. It is a long voyage you are bound on, father, after you leave me. You will meet your father again, my daughter. Ah, would it were seemly for you to take me as a fellow voyager? You too have a voyage to make to a haven where you will remember your father. Shall I sail there with my mother or alone? All alone, without father or mother. What? Have you found me a new home, father? Enough of this. It is not for girls to know such things. Please hurry home from Troy, father, as soon as you have triumphed there. There is a sacrifice I have first to offer here. Yes, it, it is your duty to heed religion with aid of holy rites. You will witness it. For you will be standing near the libations. Am I to lead the dance then round the altar, father? Count you happier than myself because you know nothing. Go within. It is wrong for maidens to be seen after you have given me your hand and a kiss on the eve of your lengthy sojourn far from your father's side. Breast, cheek, and golden hair. Ah, oh, how grievous you have found Helen in the Phrygian city. I can speak no more. The tears come welling to my eyes the moment I touch you. Go, go into the house. I beg your pardon, daughter of Leda, if I showed excessive grief at the thought of giving my daughter to Achilles. For though we are sending her to taste of bliss, still it wrings a parent's heart when he, the father who has toiled so hard for them, commits his children to the homes of strangers. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so again, we'll save time for comment near the end. Uh, I uh, really uh, appreciate it. Um, I know I see Aaron is looking for the link. Um, so the next group will do Persians one. Um, so I've already forgotten who was in charge of that group. Um, that was you, Paul. All right, Paul, take over. And if you want us to do the same video thing, let me know. That would be great, yes. Yeah. So, if, um, so if you're not in this scene, if you could turn off your video and then, um, yeah, and then do the same um, um, magic trick, and that would be great. And then we've got all of our people lined up. We have, so I'm going to just hand over to them. I'm going to turn my video off. Our sacred godlike king, does he attend to me as my obscure barbarian voice sends out these riddling wretched cries? I bewail my dreadful sorrow. Does he hear me down below? 
But you, O oh earth, and you others, you powers beneath the earth, release his splendid spirit from your homes, the divine one born in Susa, the Persian's god. Send him up here, that man whose like was never laid to rest in Persian ground. The man is loved, as is his tomb. We love the virtue buried there. O oh, Idenaeus, Idenaeus. O oh, Idenaeus, Idenaeus. O oh, Idenaeus, Idenaeus, who sends shades from the dead. Send Darius up here to us. Send back our godlike king. That ruler never lost our men to ruinous death in war. And Persians hailed him as divine in his wise counsel. For like a god, when he led his army out to fight, he planned things brilliantly. Alas. O oh, king. Our old great king. Approach us now. Draw near. Rise to the summit of your tomb. Lift up the saffron slipper on your foot. Reveal the royal ornaments of your imperial crown. And come to us, O Father Darius, who never caused us pain. Come listen to our latest grief, the sorrow felt throughout this land. O King of Persia's king, appear, for over us the darkness spreads a Stygian gloom, since our young men have just been utterly destroyed. So come to us, O Father Darius, who never caused us pain. Aye! Aye! Aye. Aye. O you, whose death was mourned so bitterly among your friends. O great and powerful king. If you had been in full command, who in this land would now be grieving such twin calamitous defeats. Our three-tiered ships. Now ships no more have been completely overwhelmed. Our ships, our ships no more. You, loyal men in whom I placed my trust. You ancient Persians, once my youthful friends, what troubles are now threatening the state? The soil is beaten down and torn apart. It groans in great distress. I see my wife beside my tomb. And so I grow concerned. I've received the offerings she made with favor while you men have been standing there close to my grave, chanting your laments. As with loud cries to summon up the dead, you have been calling piteously for me. But there is no easy path from down below. Beneath the earth, the gods are much more prone to welcome bodies than to send them back. Still, I have some authority down there and I have come. But you must not waste time so I do not get blamed for my delay. What new disaster weighs the Persians down? I especially like Darius coming in from Mordor or a place somewhat like it, right? Um, no, thank you very much. And uh, I'll resist more comment because we've got to go to Persians 2, um, led by uh, Tabitha. Hello. I would love to keep the same. Uh, if you're not on, turn your videos off. And if you could uh, hide non-video participants, that would be great. Um, I think we're just waiting for Abigail, Al, Deborah, Lana, and Diane. All right. Just wanted to bring them on briefly. This is the group. All right. And you can do what you do. Also, Paul, your video is still on. Oh, my situation is now desperate. My luck has led me to a cruel fate, which I did not foresee. How savagely a demon trampled on the Persian race. What must I still endure in this distress? As I look up on these ancient citizens, the strength in my limb fails. Oh, how I wish a fatal doom from Zeus had buried me with all those men who perished. Alas, my king, for our brave force and the mighty honor of Persia's influence, those splendid men whom fate has now cut down. The earth laments her native youth, 
the soldier Xerxes killed, who filled all Hades with the Persian dead. So many men, our country's flowers, slain, thousands perishing from enemy bows, a close packed multitude, all dead and gone. Alas, alas, for all our brave protectors. Oh, sovereign of the earth, all Asian lands are now upon their knees. A dreadful sight, just so dreadful. You see me here, alas, a sad and useless wretch who has become an evil presence for my race and for my native land. For your return, I will send out in these harsh sounding tones, a cry of ominous grief, one full of tears, a shout of Mariandinian sorrow. Then let your sad lament resound, a harsh and plaintive cry, for the God has turned against me. Yes, I will sing my tearful chant to honor the men who suffered so in that defeat at sea a dirge from those who mourn this land and lament its slaughtered sons. My doleful grief I voice once more. Ionian Ares, with those ships of war, turned the tide of victory and swept our troops away. The Greek fleet raised the murky sea and that fatal cliff on shore. Weep for that catastrophe, let your tears fall, then return back to your homes. Oy moy, such grief, oh, our distress. Your cries of sorrow, let them echo mine. An answering cry of anguished pain from one grief to another. Cry out and link together our laments. Ah, misfortune's hard to bear for I too share your grief. For my sake, beat your chest and groan. My sorrow drenches me with tears. Shout out your cries to answer mine. We will respond to you, my king. Now raise your voices high in your laments. Aye, once more we mix our song of Greek with these dark blows of pain. Now beat your chest and do and as you do, howl out a misty and strain. Such grief, such sorrow. And tear those white hands on your, chin, on your chin. With fists I clench my beard and moan. Let your shrill cries ring out. I will cry out. And with your fingers rip your flowing robes. The pain, the sorrow. Now tug your hair as you cry for our lost army. With these fists I clench my hair and moan. Let your eyes fill with tears. They do, they do. Shout out your cries to answer mine. I shout my cries. And now, as you lament, go home. I, I such grief to move across our Persian land. Such grief throughout the city. So much pain, so much distress. Tread softly as you wail your grief. Oh. Oh, such grief to move across our Persian land. Uh, alas, for those destroyed in the flat bottom boats, the power of those three tier galleys. I will be your escort and attend on you with mournful cries of sorrow. So, all around, it was really neat for me to see these three performances in a row because I went in and saw little bits of each one. And frankly, at many moments, I saw uh, confusion and disorganization and you all brought it together. Um, I really liked the way in that one, you had the videos working to have people come in at different times. Um, so we have 10 minutes uh, before we're gonna go. And I'm gonna just close it at, at, at the hour because I know people have things to do. Um, so please, could we have some responses, right? Um, what was it like doing this? Um, what was it like working with people you didn't know before? Um, what was it like working on a clock in this way? Um, please raise your hands if you can. 
If not, just unmute. I'm seeing some chat there. Um, yeah, the Xerxes was great. Uh, people are getting worn out. Um, so <laughs> one of the things I really appreciated going room to room is seeing how the nice mixture of people who are really involved, who do this professionally and who also do it, you know, from an amateur level. So um, Diane, I see your hand. Oops, it was fun. I mean, it was, as it's always really fun to collaborate with people, especially, um, I don't get to do the acting part ever. So that was fun. <laughs> it looked like, right, uh, other reflections? Lana? Even though there's, it, there's always this feeling of there's never enough time, but it's so useful to have that structure in place. It really creates this pressure cooker and yeah. you just have to, like Paul was saying, you know, go with that, that first instinct in a way. And there were ideas that we, in the last two minutes almost, we were like, okay, let's do this, this, this. We didn't get to try it, but then we did it. Just how, how you don't necessarily need to, um, you, can, you can have a really good product surprisingly with, with very little preparation sometimes, <laughs> or just be willing to take the risk, I would say. And that, you know, that goes nicely with what Paul was saying earlier in that all these performances are, are, are part of the process, right? It's not an end product, right? Um, Amy. I, once again, noticing, as I notice every time, how even the smallest bit of play gives us tons to talk about and work on. So that was partly the time limitation, but also again, I, I get I I get hung up on completism and what we're missing, and mm -hmm. to re remember once again that any little bit that you spend time on is going to reveal so much. Thank you, Amy. Deborah. Yeah, hand. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the process. Um, it, for someone who's trying to translate Persians right now, it was very interesting to see what things seem to work in performance and what things I should be careful about. And I also really wanted to thank uh, Tabitha, who who asked us such good questions. And also, we were a very sort of talkative bunch. And you managed to both make space for us all and also keep us progressing towards, a, towards an end. So it was, thanks. I, yeah, thank you, Tabitha. And if we could all just take a minute so I don't forget to thank Tabitha, Evie, Tim, and Eunice for joining us today. Um, yeah. I don't think Paul and I, Paul and I planned this way back in May and we didn't invite them till late. Um, so as usual, they're heroes for just jumping in with us and going along. So thank you guys. I think you know how much I appreciate you, but I'll send a gushing email later. Um, other comments about the experience of uh, the time limit, or uh, were you guys surprised by how fast it came together? I see you, Chorus, or so Simone. I see your Sorry, hand. I forgot to rename myself. I just wanted to say thank you all, and I especially like the opportunity to have this workshop with professional guidance for thinking about how one could do this in a classroom setting. Mm -hmm. um, inevitably, not as good as under professional guidance, but still so helpful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. So one thing, you know, as we're sort of in the uh, downward slide in the last five minutes, I do want to uh, say that, uh, and I'll flip to Paul and Eunice here, um, but, uh, and, and Lana, we are gonna keep this up. Uh, we're gonna keep doing Reading Greek Tragedy online in some form or another, not every week, uh, because we don't wanna be murdered by spouses and families for doing this. We don't wanna become Greek tragedies, um, but we are gonna be doing new stuff um, and there will be more epic, Simone, and who knows? So one of the things that we do is we don't have too many rules. Um, so if you want to get involved, if you want to okay. share ideas, please reach out uh, to Paul or me or Lana, and we'll see what, what we can do. Um, because we, you know, what I've cherished among many things um, is getting to know new people, uh, meeting new friends, and having the hope that someday I'll meet you in person. Um, and then and you'll get to guess, will I be shorter or taller than you suspect? <laughs> um, so please do that. I, that invitation is standing. We're not done doing this. Um, and we really would like to hear from you. Um, right. So Paul and Lana, maybe you can talk a few uh, for a few minutes about what's coming next. And then Eunice, I know um, a, a, pro, a program is sort of emerging out of this experience too. 
Um, yes, yeah, so um, as Joel was saying, we are going to be carrying on. We're going to start again in February and run it um, and run it monthly. Um, and there will all continue to be an online element. But I think what we might do as well is we're going to take um, sort of take it very loosely as being reading Greek tragedy online. There's going to be more epic and more plays sort of that are sort of inspired by um, Greek literature um, or ancient oh. literature generally. Excuse me, sorry, I'm just we're, we're back in lockdown. Here, so, um, oh, it's not um, cute. And um, the um, we're also going to be probably um, making a podcast with every episode that we do, I think, as well, so that we nice. can kind of share it in different ways um, oh. as well. Um, as a as a as a kind of connected to the project as well, I'm sort of really interested in hearing from people about what is most useful within a pedagogical setting, and what's one of the things that I'm working on at the moment um, is. Sort of developing an idea of sort of taking what we're doing with some of the performers we have and creating kind of what I'm kind of calling master classes but in terms of like looking at just one scene and then getting a director and saying okay here's one scene and here it's played three different ways um, yes. and looking at the different options that are available to um, performances um, and things like that and kind of creating sort of 15 kind of minute long videos um, around that sort of idea and hopefully that would be something that um, we can kind of get going in the new okay. year. Uh, but I'll hand over to Lana now and before on to you. Okay. Right, uh, I shall go. Um, uh, along with doing all of this, I'm uh, Dean of the um, British American Drama Academy that has various acting programs and also um, a, an academic Shakespeare program. But out of this, and Paul is going to be director of this course, we have um, a four week course on Greek theatre. Um, it's actually called Greek Theatre from the Ancient World to the Modern through Theory and Performance. And it is from June to early July, and it is going to be um, a group of 16. So it's going to be a very sort of individual experience as well. And it will be based in London, where people will go off and have lots of theatre performances, going to the RSC and the Globe as well, and uh, British Museum and private galleries, then off to Greece, where um, I wish I could take my bag as well. And they'll be going to Delphi and Nathos and Mycenae and you know, Herodicus and Epidavros and the Acropolis and Museum and working with workshops with professional and practitioners there. And then back to Oxford, where they will finish their four weeks and be based there at the archive for performance of Greek and Roman drama, which is the largest archive in the world, as you all know, and that's mm -hmm. um, Fiona McIntosh. And so that'll be just fabulous. It'll be very intensive, hard work and great fun. And we hope to launch it, though of course with COVID, we don't quite know, but we hope to launch it um, this June and July. And if not, it will be there and ready for you. So please put it out to your students and um, you'll see it on the website, which we can give you. And uh, yeah, all the information's there about the course. So look forward to that. Thank you, Eunice. Um, and, and Lana, do you have some uh, comments? I, I, about where yeah, I don't have much to add. I, we have a planning meeting coming up soon. So I'm, I'm looking forward to us uh, finalizing our plans for the spring and um, I can pay, post the link in here for, to the CHS website where, we'll, where we will continue to post information about the upcoming episodes and there's a full list of the episodes we've done already. Um, and definitely, yeah, we love hearing about how people are using these in their, in their classes and I think one of the long term plans might be to put together some use scenarios or to share ideas about how people can incorporate these techniques into their courses. And uh, I think we're, we're also all available if you just want to bounce some ideas around and, and provide some feedback. And I mean, while as long as we're in the Zoom era, um, if you guys have classes and you want me and I'll volunteer Paul if he can do it or any, to jump in to show up and talk, I'm happy to do that. Um, but also I want to echo what Lana just said. Um, Paul and I are very excitable um, and we really like new ideas and we, we commit to things when we shouldn't and we do them anyway. Um, so I really, I really look forward to hearing comments, ideas, uh, you know, directions about what we should do next. 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be careful. No, and contact us anyway. You can find us on Twitter, right? Our emails or, or wherever. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I really am grateful you all came. Um, yesterday, Paul and I were like, well, we didn't do advanced registration. So there may be nobody there um, and we would have done something. Um, so really, I appreciate you all. Um, I hope you stay safe and well um, and enjoy the rest of the conference um, and uh, the new Senate majority. So <laughs> take care. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. This is great.